So what I wanted to do, I wanted to speculate together. I wanted to offer various theories as to how my grandfather became the great Torah scholar, the great sage, the great impact personality of his era. How did that happen? You know, I have a bunch of stories marbleized with lessons to do that. So I want to begin with a very vivid memory that I have from my grandfather's funeral. My grandfather passed away in Pesach of 2005. I was in Israel with him. In fact, I spent some of the last days of his life, I was with him in the hospital. That year, Pesach started on Matzah Shabbos on Saturday night. So for us Americans, it was Sunday, Monday was the festivals. And then Tuesday was the Cholamoid, was the intermediate days. And Monday night he passed away. Now for the Israelis, they only keep one day of, of Yom Tif, only one day of the festival. And they had only Sunday was the festival. And thus Monday was already Cholamoid. And uh, that was already the intermediate days. And Monday night he passed away. Erev Shabbos, Friday afternoon, he went to the hospital. He was very sick. He's been, he was sick for already a couple of months. And he was bleeding and he was in pain. It was just a miserable experience. And they brought him to the hospital and... He was there until he passed on Monday night. Now, on Shabbos afternoon, I walked over to the hospital and I spent that night, which was the Lela Seder, was the Seder night, I spent with him in the hospital. It's a very memorable, very vivid memories from this Pesach with my grandfather. And he was in and out of consciousness. And in fact, the sources talk about how when someone is righteous and they're about to pass, they're already kind of edging towards that world and they're in this intermediate stage between here and there and thus you only see brief lapses, so to speak, in uh, in their consciousness because they're already transcending to the next world. And I remember that, you know, he was there and I was there with him. It was just me and him in the room and in fact, Israeli hospitals. So they put three people in the same room and they only separate them by a curtain. And for some reason, my grandfather, the hearing aid was a little bit off. So it was making this shrilly sound. It was, remember, it's Shabbos. So his ear, his hearing aid, he used to take up his hearing aid usually before Shabbos. But again, he was, he was in the hospital. He wasn't, he wasn't really functioning at peak capacity. So his hearing aid is on and it wasn't attuned to the right frequency. And so it has this very high pitched, shrilly sound that was driving the guy in the room in the curtain next to us bonkers. But it was Shabbos. I couldn't, I couldn't adjust it. But anyhow, over the course of Shabbos and the following night, Pesach, he's talking to people that are not in the room. He's talking to his mother, having a very long extended conversation with his mother. And I say to him, I say, Saba, your mother, she passed away in, in the war in the 1940s. She's not here. What, who are you talking to? It was a very unusual thing for me to witness. So he's like, no, she's alive. I say, no, but she passed away almost well, 70 plus years ago. No, she's alive. And of course, we believe, the Talmud tells us, that tzadikim bimisasim kurim chayim, the righteous people, even after they've passed, they're still alive because their neshama, their soul, is still alive within them. One of my most distinct memories was at 3 a.m. Now remember, this is, this is Pesach. It's the Passover Seder. It's the most important night of the Jewish calendar. And my grandfather doesn't even know it's Pesach. And we're eating these square matzahs that are gifted to us by the hospital. And it was like, this is like not the way you want to spend Pesach. And I remember trying to tell my grandfather, it's Pesach now. And, and he was he was not there. And then, and then it clicked. But then he was like, he was not with me again. Anyhow, at three in the morning, after trying really hard to reposition him, because every position was uncomfortable. So he was lying on his back, had to turn around. And it took like a half hour to move him because every every movement was painful, a very hard, you know, hard and heartbreaking thing to witness. So I remember he's sitting on his bed and it's 3 a.m. And this is Pesach for me. I'm 18 years old at the time. And I say, you know what? I'm going to take this opportunity. He's sitting on the bed. So I just sit down on the floor right next to him. And I say to him, Saba, ten li bracha. Give me a bracha. Give me a blessing. So he puts his hand on my head and he says the following nine words. Tilmad Chumash Tov, Tilmad Mishnatov, Tilmad Gemaratov. 
study Chumash well, study the Torah well, study Mishnah well, study Talmud well. And then I said to him, but what about a Shinuch? What about finding a spouse? So he asks me, how old are you? 18. No, you're too young. You're too young. But anyhow, I think I might have gotten the final blessing. Maybe he gave someone else the, the next day. I don't know. But I might have gotten the final blessing that my grandfather my grandfather gave in his lifetime. But anyhow, Matzei Yomtif, it's Monday night. We get a call, rush to the hospital. Rush to the hospital. And by the time we got there, he had already passed. And incidentally, I like to always tell over what happened after he passed. My grandfather, like all the Bali Musa, they're always planning for their for their demise. And in fact, the Talmud encourages us. It's a very useful exercise to always think about the fact that we're here temporarily and we're going to pass and we should try to do whatever we can to make sure that our eternal existence after we pass, once our soul has been removed from our body, that we're in good shape for that. And the Bali Musa were always – that was always front and center of, of their lives. In fact, my grandfather, when he was 40, he told his wife, okay, now we're 40. It's time to prepare for, for dying. Because after all, you're 40 now. You're, you're already advanced age. Anyhow, he had written a sava, a last will and testament. It's more like an ethical will. And it was always in his desk. You open up the desk and you see an envelope. And it says, open it when I pass. So everyone's super curious. What's he going to say? And then every couple of years he would update it. Who knows what's going to say? But you can't open it, of course, until he passes. So someone rushed back to his apartment and brought the envelope and brought it back to the to the hospital. And the first words, these are blazing into my memory the first words, he writes as follows. Du, you should know that my real tzava, my actual last will and testament, is found in Aleishur, volume 1, page 303. What? How did he sleep that by everyone, right? So someone ran to get the book, and you open up the page 303, and it starts off the top of the page. To my sons and my daughters and my followers, you should be well. And it's a whole three-page tzava. And the way he did that, the way he framed it is that's the th- the fourth section of the first volume. In that section, he talks about how to, how to die. And he, he writes that everyone should write for themselves and for their children an ethical will. And he says, let me give you a sample. Here's a sample. This is a sample of a tzava that was written by one of Rabbi Yerucham Levavitz's students. And it's a whole three-page tzava. And then he reveals the secret. He pulls up the curtain and and he does the grand reveal. Oh, by the way, that was mine. And uh, this is just the technical stuff, but that's that's the real tzava. But anyhow, in Yerushalayim, there's a custom. Whenever someone passes, you right away bury them. You right away bury them. That's just the rule. Because it's one of the customs of, of the of the Hever Kadisha, of the Burial Society of Jerusalem. You don't let the, the body linger. Unless there is a benefit for the deceased. In fact, this comes from the Talmud. The Talmud says, once someone passes, you try to wait, you right away to try to accelerate, you try to accelerate the, the burial. And unless there's extenuating circumstances that are for the benefit of the deceased, you don't, uh, you don't wait before burying them. So they went to Rabbi Yashif, who was alive at the time, he was one of the great rabbis, one of the great rabbis of, of his era. And they said to him, well, it's now Matzei Yamtiv. It's at night. Can we wait till the following afternoon that there will be more of a respectable crowd by the funeral? So Rabbi says, yes. So they set the funeral time for the following day at noon. I think it was 12 noon. And if you've been to a uh, well-attended funeral in Jerusalem or any rabbinic funeral, there's always, you know, signs plastered throughout the whole city, and they have the crier, they call him the Malach Amavis, the angel of death, the one who goes in the car and announces when the funeral times is. So I remember that, you know, you wake up in the morning, and it's kind of it's kind of surreal. Your grandfather's passed. The whole city is plastered in signs telling about the details of the funeral and the shiva. And you hear this, the, the shrilly cry of uh, of the passing car announcing the time for the Leviah, uh, the time for the funeral. So we got to the funeral, and he had written in his Sava, he doesn't want to be eulogized. 
He doesn't want people giving plaudits for him. He doesn't want it. And it worked out nicely because it was Cholamoid, it was the intermediate days of Pesach, and therefore the halacha is that you're not allowed to offer any eulogies. The only thing that they mentioned before the funeral departed was that the Beis HaMusser, which is the institution that he founded in Jerusalem, that will forever remain open. So the funeral began and there were tens of thousands of people there. Somewhere between 50 and 100,000 people. So it was a gargantuan funeral. People uh, people were there. Incidentally, my wife was an attendee of this funeral. This is, of course, two years before we got married. But anyhow, there is another rule that the Chavar Kaddish, the Baruch Society, have in Jerusalem, and that is that none of the direct descendants of the deceased can participate in the actual funeral in the actual procession of walking the, the, the body, walking the bier to its resting place in, in the cemetery. That's one of the rules. And therefore, they set us very clearly. You can't even take one step. That's the minute, that's the custom of Jerusalem. You can't even take one step. You have to stay here. So from the entire walk from his yeshiva in, in a, a neighbor called uh, Gushmonim, all the way to Har Menuchos, which was all done by foot. It was a two hour odyssey. We had to stay behind. We couldn't participate in the actual procession. So I remember we're sitting there, all of our cousins, it's all of our family, and we're just – we're discussing. We're having a conversation because we're you know we're participating in the funeral, but we can't really actually go. So we can see the people go, but once they leave the neighborhood, we can't even follow them at all. So I remember one of my cousins made the following observation. Talmud tells us, the book of Yom, page 35b – that there are three people that are going to come to God in judgment. A poor person, a rich person, and a wicked person. And of course, the Almighty is going to debrief him. And the Almighty is going to start investigating the day of reckoning, why didn't you study Torah sufficiently? So the poor person, the pauper, is going to be asked the question first. And they're going to say to him, why did you not study Torah? And he'll respond, after all. I was poor. I was destitute. I was penniless. I was so busy trying to find a livelihood for my family. How do you expect me to study Torah? And the response is going to be, well, were you poorer than Hillel? And he gives the whole story about Hillel. Hillel, the great leader of the Jewish people, the greatest leader of his time, he was so poor that he was a wood chopper, and his daily intake, his daily income, half of it would go to pay the pittance that was needed to get into the base medrash to go study, and half of it would be used for his family expenses. And of course, it was one day, it was Friday, and he had no money, and he still wanted to go in to study, but the guard at the door did not allow him in. So he climbed onto the roof and put his ear by the by the skylight and was participating in the lecture below of Shemaya and Avtalion. And they're studying the whole night, and it's snowy, and in the morning... They comment, wait a minute, it's a little bit dark in the room. And they look up and they see the silhouette of Hillel underneath significant snowfall. And they rush up and climb into the roof, resuscitate him. And they, they, they conclude, you know, this is someone that's really worthwhile to desecrate the Shabbos over. Clear him out of the snow and make the fire to heat it up for him. It's worthwhile because look at Hill. You know, if we're going to desecrate the Shabbos to save a life, this is the life that we want to save. Look how poor he was and look at his dedication to Torah study. Okay, the next person is brought in. The rich person. Well, why didn't you study Torah? Me? I had so many assets. I had so many businesses. I had so many properties. I had so much stuff going on financially. I couldn't concentrate on Torah. And they'll say to him, well, were you rich in the great Rabbi Elazar ben Kharsum? He had a thousand islands, a thousand fleets of ship. He had so much property, he didn't know what to do with it. And in fact, it gives a story that once he himself was accosted by one of his employees. His employees didn't even know who, who he was because he had so many employees, he had so many assets, and yet he became a great Torah scholar. Again, it's going to invalidate the argument, the excuse of the rich person. And finally, you have the wicked person. And the wicked person is going to be brought before God. And God's going to say, well, why didn't you study Torah? And he's going to say, well, look at me. Look how handsome I am. Look how desirous I am. All the women were coming after me. How do you expect me not to sin? How do you expect me to focus on Torah study? And the response 
to the wicked person is going to be, well, were you more handsome than Joseph? Did you face more difficult challenges than Joseph? His master's wife was always getting dressed up for him. She would change her garb morning and evening, yet he stayed resolute to, to his principles, yet he didn't sin. That's the Talmud. And the Talmud concludes with the following statement. Nimtza, turns out, Hillel, Hillel mechayi v'saniyim. Hillel is going to obligate the poor people. He's going to obviate the excuse of poorness for not studying Torah. Rabbi Elazar and Kharsam, he's going to be mechayev, he's going to obligate the rich people. And Yosef, Joseph, is going to be mechayev, is going to obligate the sinners. Says my cousin, someone's going to come to God. And God's going to say, well, why don't you study Torah? And he's going to say, well, I had no background. I wasn't raised in an environment that encouraged it. I was someone who grew up distant from Torah. And you know what they're going to say? Look at Rabbi Wolby. Look where he came from and look what he became. And that is going to be, remember my, my cousin say, Saba, my grandfather, is going to be, Mechaib is going to obligate the people who have a very weak background in traditional Jewish learning. He's going to be the one that's going to remove, going to banish those excuses. Look where he came from and look what he became. He was someone who opened up yeshivos. He was someone who wrote transformational magisterial works on Musser. He's someone who's considered, I think this is uh, the consensus, he is the one who took the vibrant, rich, robust world of Musser that existed in the pre-war yeshiva world, and he transmitted it to the next generation. The great Mir Yeshiva, which he was an, an alumnus of, incidentally, so am I. And so was, I guess, half of uh, religious Jewry. He was someone who was participating in this Yeshiva when this was the number one Yeshiva in the country, in the, in the whole world. There were hundreds of, of Torah giants, veritable Torah giants, that were numbered amongst its ranks. And when those Torah giants would go study in the Mir Yeshiva, they wouldn't go to the Rosh Yeshiva's lectures to go study how to study. They wouldn't even go to the other lectures on the Talmud. They would all go to the great Mashiach, the great Rabbi Rucham Levavitz. He was the attraction to the Mir Yeshiva. Rabbi Chaim Shmulevitz, where did he study his, his intensity? Where did he pick it up from? They say it was all from Rabbi Rucham. Rabbi Rucham was the one who formulated the giants of the Mir and how they, how they engage with Torah. And then you have the German, Walby, someone who was not considered amongst the giants of the Mir in his day, but he became the quintessential student of Rabbi Rucham. He became the authoritative personality to take all that greatness that Rabbi Rucham had and to transmit it to the next, to the next generation. Rabbi Rucham's students would never have guessed in a million years that the ultimate paradigmatic student of Rabbi Rucham would be... Shlomo Walby, at that day still going by his uh, slave name, Wilhelm Walby, Willie Walby, he's going to be the one to do it? No way! He didn't have the background for it. He wasn't brought up in such an environment. And he's going to be the one who's going to say to everyone, everyone, they're going to point to him, and they're going to say, okay, if he could do it, why couldn't you have done it? So what I want to do today, I want to ask the question, how indeed did he do it? How did he become so big? How did he become so great? How did he become such a transformative sage of his era? And I have a variety of theories to present as to how he became that great. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through some stories, but we're going to include within it lessons and, and takeaways that we could perhaps use to enrich our growth pattern and uh, take lessons from him of how he became what he became and hopefully we could integrate them into, into our own life. So in Alei Shur, volume one, he writes as follows. The term Alei Shur, it's a very unusual phrase. It's from the book of Genesis, chapter 49. When Jacob is blessing his children before his passing, he gives a blessing 
to his son, or to all his sons, right? He starts off Reuven, Shimon, and Levi. It doesn't seem like it's actual. It's actually a blessing. And then he goes on to Judah. He gives him a more lavish blessing. But the most lavish of his blessings is reserved for Joseph. One of the things that he mentions is Benos Tsaada Ale Shur. The girls climbed up upon the ramparts. Meaning that when Joseph was being paraded throughout the city after he was nominated to become the viceroy of Egypt, they took him on a cavalcade throughout the land and everyone was craning their necks to get a glimpse of Joseph. And the girls of Egypt would climb up on the walls, on the ramparts, to get a glimpse of Joseph. So Ale Shur means upon the walls or upon the ramparts. Why do you give such a strange name to the book that you're writing? So, of course, there's a lot of reasons. But if you read the introduction to Ale Shur, he says, there is a thick wall that separates the Torah world from the world at large. And even people that are nominally religious, and even people that are in yeshiva, many of them are unaware of the beautiful, powerful, incredible world of Torah. In this book, in Ale Shur, we're going to climb up Ale Shur, upon the ramparts, upon the wall that separates these two worlds. We're going to scour that world. We're going to take a tour upon the ramparts and examine everything that's happening in this wonderful world. And then, after you finish it once, hopefully the second time you read the book, you'll climb down off the ramparts and try to find the gate, try to find the entrance, try to find the portal to actually join that world yourself. But in addition, he writes that we know there is a a custom to name your book after your – or to hint your name in, in your own book. So my grandfather's name was Shlomo. His wife's name was Rivka. And the last name is Volba, which is Walby. So those three letters, Shin, Vav, Resh, Shlomo, Volba, Rivka. Okay, that's nice. It's hinted his name, his wife's name. But he writes as follows. This is a quote. Ale Shur is the gematria, is the numerical value of Ner Nishmas Rosa Rivka, the candle of the soul of Rosa Rivka, the mother of the author. Only thanks to her dedication for his education, to Torah and to mitzvos, that's the only reason why he arrived at this point. A woman who is rare in the beauty of her character, in her fear of God, in her wisdom, and in her suffering. So if you ask my grandfather the same question, how did he become so big? Here he has the answer. He writes it himself. His mother, she was the one who contributed to him becoming that big. So what are the stories about his mother? So he used to tell us that when his mother used to bring him to shul, he the first time she brought him to shul, he, he took her hands and he kissed her hands. He was so excited to finally be there. To be in shul, he had a certain, a certain draw to spirituality from a very young age. And when his mother brings him, he, want, he was so excited, he, he just kissed her hands. And then in addition, my grandfather, when he was young, his father was a very uh, sophisticated academic. His father was a very talented individual, Eugene, Professor Dr. Eugene Walby. Uh, He was someone who was an author, was... um, was a professor. He was. He spoke twelve languages. He was. He was a real, real talented individual, and he wrote like fifty books. Even though he only he passed away fairly young, he wasn't even sixty when he passed away. Very talented individual, but someone who was not necessarily, uh, not necessarily someone who had an affinity for Torah. And think about it. We know what what Germany was like, what Berlin was like, in the turn of the century. It wasn't exactly a hub of uh, of Torah vibrancy. But anyhow. He was a professor for, for English and French, and he befriended the local Orthodox rabbi, who was also someone who was classically trained, and I think in English and French as well. And they struck up, they had a good relationship. This is a, a fellow, Rabbi Chaim Kohn. And when Rabbi Chaim Kohn was opening up his doors to allow young students to come study by him, my great-grandfather, 
my grandfather's father, said, that's okay, you can study with Rabbi Cohen, he's all right. So you would go periodically as a young child, they would go study Mishnayis by this Rabbi Cohen, by this Orthodox rabbi who lived in their neighborhood. And my grandfather used to always say that he remembered looking back after his mother dropped him off, every time his mother dropped him off, he would look at her and he would see that she had tears cascading down her cheeks. He was always crying for him that he should become a Tamil Chacham, he should become a Torah scholar, he should become a very good Jew. My brother told me that, that he asked our grandfather, how did he become such a great uh, Torah scholar? How did he become such a big tzaddik? So he said that when he was really young, his mother would, you know, she would tie his shoes and she would get him dressed. She would whisper into his ear, be a Torah scholar. Kamatam al-Chacham, study Torah, do mitzvos. She would like integrate it into him from a very young age. And that's what he says. That's the answer that he gives to our question. His mother had supreme dedication, prodigious dedication to him becoming a Torah scholar, to him studying Torah, and that overpowered everything. Now, it's interesting. I looked at Ali Shur Volume 2. In the introduction, he also attributes his success to people. This time, it's not to his mother, it's to his father-in-law and his wife. And I think maybe one of the takeaways of this is that there's a certain degree of humility not to ascribe his own successes to his own hard work. Right before he passed away, I was in yeshiva in Israel, a yeshiva headed by one of his students. And his student would go visit his Rebbe, his teacher, my grandfather, periodically. And every time he would go, he would ask, my grandfather would ask the head of the yeshiva, well, how are my grandchildren doing? And he would say, they're doing fabulous, they're doing stellar, they're doing fantastic, even though probably for me there was a little bit of a, of a stretch, shall we say. But he would, he would say, they're doing okay, they're, they're doing great. And my grandfather quipped, the reason why they're doing great it's because our father, his son, his son Dick, when he was when he was born by his bris, the person who held him by the bris was the great Chazanish. And because Chazanish held my my father by his bris, that's why I, you know his kids turned out okay. That's why we turned out okay. So the head of the yeshiva would say to my grandfather, says, "What about you? What about your contribution?" And he would say, "No, no, it's because of the Chazanish." So he used to always say. So, okay, so we have at least one answer to this question. How did Rav become so big? It's, according to him at least, it's because of the dedication and self-sacrifice of others, most prominently his mother. I want to share with you another speculation. During the war, my grandfather spent eight years in neutral Sweden. Now, how he arrived in Sweden is a saga on its own, because he was studying in the Mir Yeshiva from 1934 to 1938. And somehow from 1938 to 1946, he ended up in all places in, in Sweden. How did a German Yeshiva student studying in Poland end up in Sweden, in Stockholm, for the duration of the war? So the answer is because he wanted to open a Yeshiva in Copenhagen, in Denmark. And he had spoken to a friend that we're going to open it together. And they had reached out to the rabbi of, of Copenhagen, a fellow by the name of Rabbi Jacobson. And they said to him, okay, we want to discuss with you this plan of opening up yeshiva in Copenhagen, in Denmark. And they met. And uh, that idea was kind of floating in the ether that maybe he's going to open up yeshiva in Denmark. Meanwhile, this Rabbi Jacobson, he was visiting Stockholm in Sweden and he met with one of the local um, Orthodox uh, people who lived there in the neighborhood. And he said to him, I have children and there's no one to teach my children. Can you recommend some European yeshiva student that could come move to Sweden and would be a, a good teacher for my, for my children? So he said, you know what, this Wolby character, he wants to open up a yeshiva in Denmark. It sounds like a pipe dream, but he's probably a good candidate. Why don't you hire him? So my grandfather gets a letter. Okay, we want you to come to Sweden 
to be the the you know the teacher of of these children. Now at the time, Poland was not renewing any visas for any German citizens. Because of course, you know, Hitler was stirring the pot and he was uh, saber rattling the entire continent. And therefore they said, you know what, every every German citizen, no matter if they could be Jewish, doesn't matter, we suspect them they're a spy, we're not we're not renewing their visa. So my grandfather had to leave. And he was trying really hard, 1938, to, to get a visa to go back to Poland, to go back to the yeshiva that he was in, that he was flourishing in for four years. And he couldn't get a visa. Finally, he managed to get a three-month temporary visa. And he goes from, from Hanukkah to Pesach time. He has a three-month visa to be in, in Poland. That time expires, and now we're to go. So he wanted to go to Lithuania, couldn't get into Lithuania, he wanted to go to other yeshivas, to Kelm, to Tells. Nothing was working. His only option, his only two options were either to go back to Germany, which is a very bad idea, 1938, for a Jewish person, or to go to Sweden. And he chose, obviously, the lesser of those two bad options. And in 1938, he moves to Sweden. So what does he do there? So the first thing he does, he's teaching children. He opens up a shul slash base hamusser, and he's trying to create for himself a wholesome religious environment in a place not known for for religion or for flourishing in Torah. My grandfather himself wrote in one of his books that all the yeshiva students and the rabbinic leadership that moved to Sweden, within a month, most of them, they went off the derech. One of, most of them abandoned their Torah. It was, it, was, it was a place that was pulsating with heresy. And he went there, he was there for eight years, and not only did he not regress, he became something much bigger than he was when he, when he went in there. He attributes this, and he writes this in one of his books, he attributes this because every single day he would study Musar. He would study the ethical teachings of Musar. And he says, I'm only writing this because I don't view this to be boastful in any way. This is just the equivalent of someone saying, I survived during a famine by eating bread. I survived the spiritual famine of living in Sweden by eating the bread of Musar. That's what he's saying. So he gets to Sweden, and first order of business, become proficient in Swedish. He had written a book, uh, an introductory book to Judaism at the age of 16 in German. He takes that book and translates it and expands it into Swedish. And once the war begins, he becomes very critical towards the Vad Hatzala efforts of the Jews throughout, throughout Europe. So he secured, for example hundreds of visas to the small Caribbean country of Curacao for yeshiva students. And he was working day and night, in fact, on a starvation diet. He would only pop in his mouth some chocolate bars or some chocolate, some pieces of chocolate. And in fact, he got a stomach illness as a result. Incidentally, I like to say, you know, people think of the great rabbis and the great Muslim personalities as being all dour and having no personality. My grandfather had a sweet tooth his whole life. He loved chocolate. He loved ice cream. He had a wickedly hilarious sense of humor. I always tell the story. We used to be congregated by him every month of Shabbos, every Saturday night. So he would have in his, his tiny, tiny apartment, his entire apartment, you could fit two of them in my bedroom. But my bedroom's not that big. Tiny. So you have one room that doubled as the library and the living room and the dining room and, and the, it was a small room with a small round table and all of the grandchildren would sit around and my grandfather would be there as well and he was in his own world almost always. And we would sit there and, you know, we would sit there and chat and that was like our thing. We'd just do Masa Shabbos. So my brother, my brother Yoni, he once walked in. Now Yoni, my older brother, my grandfather maybe tolerated me, shall we say? He absolutely adored my brother Yoni. From a very early age, he said, this is a special kid. This kid's going to become something big. And he always loved him. So my brother Yoni walked into the room. 
he came to join this this convention of, of cousins. We're sitting with my grandpa. Have a good time. Now, he's a yeshiva student, so he's wearing this big black hat. So they say to my grandfather, Saba, tira mi idea. Saba, look who, look who came. So my grandfather looks up and says, I don't see anyone. So they say to him, no, 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 you need idea. So he looks up again, looks straight at my brother, and he says, I don't see it. I see a hat. I see a hat. So Yoni pulls off his hat and he's like, oh, Yoni's here. That was the joke that he used to always – I was there when he did, when he did this. It's kind of funny that uh, you know he was able to play around with us uh, as well. But anyhow, he's working at this feverish pace trying to help as many Shiva students as possible. I actually just read this uh, recently. He managed to secure 500 visas for the entire Miri Shiva – that was in Japan and then later Japanese occupied Shanghai to come to Sweden. So we know the story of the Mirishiva traveling across Asia to go to Japan and then to and then to Shanghai in China. But the plan was to bring him back, to back all the way across Asia and, and Europe to bring him to Sweden. They had the visas, they just didn't have the transport. Once the war started, once Operation Barbarossa began, that Trans-Siberian Railroad was reserved solely for military transport. So he's very involved in in this efforts to try to help world Jewry from his unique perch in Sweden. And one of the things that he that he was able to do was to serve as a liaison connecting the Jews living in countries that were at war. So the United States and, and Japan are at war. What happens when there's a war? There's a cessation of a postal relationship between the two countries. And therefore, you have an entire yeshiva, students, faculty, their families, they're in Japan and later in China. And a yeshiva, of course, is a nonprofit. You have to fundraise to pay for the bills. And where are you going to fundraise? You're not going to go around Japan or China to try to fundraise for yeshiva. So there were valiant people in the United States, Rabbi, Rabbi Aaron Cutler, Rabbi Avram Kalmanovich, that raised literally millions of dollars in 1940-something dollars, and they would have to ship it to Japan and China. But of course, how do you ship it to a country in which you don't have a postal relationship? So what they used to do is they used to take all the money, ship it to my grandfather in, in Sweden – he would repackage it and ship it to to China and to Japan. And after the war, my grandfather sent a letter to Rabbi Kalmanovich, who was the point man in, in the United States, detailing with German punctiliousness Every date that he received a package, exactly how much was in the package, the date that he shipped it out, a whole, a whole document with absolute precision. Not a single shekel is missing from the pot. Remember, this is at a time when my grandfather is living on a literal starvation diet and he has suitcases bursting with money and doesn't dip his toe at all into that. And then in one of my grandfather's uh, works that was written posthumously, there is this this section at the beginning that talks about you know his life and his life story, and on the bottom it speculates that we heard this is what the this is what the editor of that section writes we heard from great Torah scholars that the reason why Rabbi Walby Senior, the reason why he became this great Torah sage, this transformational personality of his era, it was because of his cleanliness in matters of money during this period when he served at, as this vital conduit through which the support to the great yeshiva in Japan and China could go through. That's the second theory. How did he become so great? How did he change himself? How did he become this great sage and rabbi? We have two answers. His mother's self-sacrifice, his de- mother, mother's dedication, and maybe it's because of his cleanliness in matters of money. But I have a simpler view on this thing. 
you look at my grandfather's life, you know, he became a paragon of, of Musser. The essence of Musser is hard work. And more specifically, it is about self-control. It's about being in total ownership of your entire life. By default, we begin our lives as a puppet in the hands of the Eight Sahara. Yitzhara says, jump, we say, how high? Yitzhara says, do this. We say, okay, we're following obediently. We're obedient servants to the Yitzhara. Musr is all about grabbing back the reins of our life. We want to be in charge. We don't want to just be sent on these missions back and forth, uh, frenetically following the orders of this, of this false God that's within us. That's what Musr is about. And the way the Musr personalities would always try to work on themselves it was always about trying to counteract the Yitzhara, counteract this other foreign interference in determining how you behave and how you live your life. So whenever you feel like an impulse, it's not guided by, by, by intellect. It's not guided by Torah. It's just you want to do something. It's not you want to do something. It's the Yitzhara manipulating you, pushing your buttons, telling you, I want you to do this. And thus, the Musra outlook is trying to get back control you, let you be the steward of your life. My grandfather used to always say, when he got to the Mir Yeshiva, he only had time to write down the lectures, either the, 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 the Talmudic lectures that he heard, or the lectures they heard from Rabbi Rucham. Oh, he could only write down one of them. And of course, which one did he want to write more? The Musr lectures of Rabbi Rucham. So what does the, what does the Musr mind tell you? Okay, do the opposite. Force yourself Force yourself to write the one that you don't want because, again, you're, you're getting a little more self-control. You know, my grandfather, even great rabbis need haircuts. So how does a great rabbi get a haircut? You're going to walk into the uh, local barber. So my brother, my brother Ellie, my oldest brother, he would come to his apartment and he would give me a haircut. And Ellie told over that once he was a little bit reckless with giving the haircut, and by mistake, he he nicked him, which is a terrible thing to do to anyone, but, you know, if it's your grandfather, and it's a great rabbi, and he's really old, you feel terrible. And he nicked him, and he started bleeding. And he said that he didn't flinch. He didn't move a muscle. That's what a Muslim personality is about. Everything that you do, every thought that you have, every action that you do, every word that you say is measured, is calculated, is thought out. You don't act on impulse. There's no knee-jerk reactions at all. And he, he became that person. He worked on himself until he had total self-control. You feel a pain, so right away you, we, we jump, we start gesticulating wildly. The Muslim personality is like, no, everything that you do, I'm in total control. Rav Leichter tells over the story, Rav Leichter is a student of my grandfather, he was once coming to a lecture for my grandfather. It was like a workshop lecture. And he was late. So he was barreling, running into the room. And he runs and slams the door open, of course. Who was behind the door? My grandfather. And like, you know, Lecter's a big guy. And he opens the door with ferocity and smashes it right into the great rabbi. And he said that my grandfather just, didn't turn around, didn't flinch, and just kept on walking. Again, this idea of your actions, who decides how you behave? The Muslim personality says, me and God via the Torah, not the Eight Sahara. My grandfather always ruminates on questions before answering them, which could be kind of frustrating. You ask a question, and you have him thinking for 25, 35 seconds, and maybe up to a minute or two minutes. You're like, this, this person's really intelligent. Why can he give me an answer instantly? Nothing's instant. Nothing's knee-jerk. Nothing's just reactionary. Everything you have to process. Everything is done almost manually. It's almost like, you know, there's a book about this. Uh, Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. There's two systems of thinking. There is the kind of the immediate impulsive response. And then there's the more, the more rigorous and methodical system two of thinking where you really think things through thoroughly. That's the way he used to always be. They they once brought a student to him. This was one of the yeshivas in Israel that was designed for 
students that are, had grown up religious in a more of a yeshiva environment, but decided to abandon that. And many of them were, were, were got into drugs and got into other uh, harmful substances. And they used to bring it to my grandfather and they would ask questions. Anyhow, there was one um, slightly delirious student that was under the impression that he was the best candidate for being Mashiach, for being the Messiah. And they brought him to my grandfather and they said, well, this student thinks that he's the Messiah. Do you think that he's the Messiah? So my grandfather thinks for like a minute and says a one-word answer. Ulai, maybe. Maybe. That, that, that was his answer. Maybe. Again, this idea of, of everything is done manually. How did he become that? How, how did he become someone who was, was such a developed personality? It's only the product of hard work. And I want to add spiritual opportunism. He was in a yeshiva in Switzerland in 1933, 1934. And he was not happy in this yeshiva. At the time, there was someone who had come to the yeshiva to give a lecture. And this was someone who was a student of the great Musser yeshivas of Europe. And he was giving a Musser lecture to the yeshiva in, in Switzerland. And my grandfather had never heard anything like this before in his life. And he was so wowed by this lecture. And then the rabbi gave a second lecture. This was like a traveling rabbi. He gave a second lecture. And my grandfather was blown away. He never, never heard anything like this. And he quickly gathered his friends over and said, okay, we have to review this speech. And they said to him, relax, chill out. It's, it's a Musr speech. It's not that too exciting. And he told them, if you are blown away by this speech, you're going to be totally blown away if you end up in Poland in the great Mir Yeshiva. Now, my grandfather's father had tolerated him traveling to Switzerland and being in the Yeshiva in Mantra because it was more of a relaxed environment and there was the possibility of also doing secular education on the side. Plus, Switzerland, it's kind of a modern place. Poland's like third world. The idea of his son going to Poland to study in the in the backwaters of the Mir Yeshiva, a town would barely had any electricity. That was unthinkable. And my grandfather is in, is in Switzerland and is being encouraged to go. So he says, I, my, my father will never sign up, sign up on this. He'll never, he'll never allow me to do it. So the person encouraged him to say, yeah, just ask him. So he says, okay, I'll write him a letter. So he writes a letter. His parents at the time were, live, were vacationing in Rome. He writes a letter to his father. I would like to go to the Mir Yeshiva in Poland. Is that okay? And to his shock, he receives the affirmation, go to Poland and good luck there. Now Later on, he asked his mother what happened. And his mother said the following. His father was a little superstitious. And he used to go visit someone who had a sixth sense, someone who was a, a clairvoyant person who would read his palm. And this person had told him, when you go to Rome, you're going to get a letter from your son with a very unusual request. Grant him his request. It's for his benefit. So he gets a letter when he's in Rome. His son wants to go to Yeshiva in Poland. So he shows it to his wife. Oh, here's what the, here's what the, this person, the psychic had, had foretold. And I'm going to grant him, allow him to go to the Yeshiva. And that's how he ended up in the Mary Yeshiva, which is a, it's a crazy story. And it's 100% true. But to me, this shows, this shows me a, a characteristic that is, I think, rare. And that is, Spiritual opportunism. I just finished uh, a book by uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. If you've heard of him, uh, one of the famous books called uh, The Black Swan. In this book, there's one line that jumped out at me where he says, opportunities 
don't come every day. If you see an opportunity, jump in it because they are exceedingly rare. I'm thinking like there's there's the kind of the this terra firma version of this idea, but there's also the spiritual version of this idea. Spiritual opportunities are rare. And throughout my grandfather's life, consistently, whenever there was an opportunity to grab onto something spiritually, he jumped in it. Go to the Mir Yeshiva. That's insane. My grandfather, my father will never let. Write him a letter. Okay, and he says yes. Okay, get, get in the train. It's time to go, to go to Poland. He ends up in Sweden. Again, this was not something that he had planned out. The Almighty almost nudges him to Sweden. And there, this is full of opportunities. The rest of the rabbinic people that come there, they, they get uh, assimilated. They're lost to their people. But the spiritual opportunity is abounding. And the whole war, he is grabbing opportunity after opportunity. At the end of the war, the war had concluded. He reads in the newspaper, there are trainloads of concentration camp survivors that are coming to Sweden. What happened was the Swedish government, of course, under the guise of humanitarianism, they had accepted 20,000 Jewish female refugees, only female. They had an imbalance that more males than females, and they wanted to bring in 20,000 girls to help bridge that gap. But anyway, my grandfather reads that, and he's like, well, maybe there are Jewish girls there as well. So he gets on a train. And he goes to this large open-air camp, this refugee camp, this resettlement camp, where all these concentration victims or or survivors are located. And he gets there, and he just sees, as far as I can see, there's just tents and and refugees everywhere. And he's like, oh my gosh, these are are Jewish girls, and they're here in Sweden. They're going to be lost. So in the middle of his tour of the facility... He had brought with him a sandwich. And he went and washed his hands for his sandwich. And then he turns around. He sees all the girls or a bunch of girls there. And they see him. And even though he was a young man, he was in his early 30s. He had a a very impressive rabbinic beard. And he wore a rabbinic hat. And they, the girls, many of them have gone through four years of absolute hell in the inferno of Europe. And they see this rabbi parachuting into their camp, washing his hands. They all burst out into tears. They all started crying. The memories of their of their homes flooded back to them. And on his train ride back, my grandfather is is, is racked with emotion. What do I do about this? I have there's there's hundreds, if not thousands, of girls here from Jewish families after going, going through all kinds or all manners of unimaginable trauma and they're here in Sweden. So during the train ride, it was a few hours away from where he lived, he decided that he's going to open up a school for them. He doesn't wait till he gets to Stockholm. He gets off at the very next train stop and sends an urgent telegram to all the members of the Vanat Sala, all the, all the people that had, that had worked with him to save the Jews during the war. And he says, we're having an urgent meeting, convened an urgent meeting for tonight. And he gets to the meeting. He describes what he witnessed. And he says, we're starting a school. Well, how are you going to start a school? The first thing you need for us is a building. How are you getting a building? How are you getting a campus? So they say, you know what, we're going to write a letter to the Department of Education in, to the Ministry of Education in, in Sweden. They write a letter and they get a letter back, how many buildings do you need? And indeed, in 1946, they opened up a school in a small town in the uh, suburbs of Stockholm, a town called Lidingo. And they had hundreds and hundreds of Jewish girls that joined this school, this seminary in the middle of nowhere. And my grandfather would come once a week to give a lecture, but he wasn't, he wasn't there a day to day. That same Jacobson family, they were heading that yeshiva, that school. And over the course of three or four years, the school was operational before the state of Israel was founded and ever moved to Israel. There were, again, 
hundreds of girls that had gone through this institution. And then when they moved to Israel, they, you know, started their lives and, and got married and had and built big, beautiful Jewish families. And they would have been lost to their people if not for the school. And who who did that? Spiritual opportunism. Get off the train right now and let's do something about it. You have an opportunity. Oh, it's so sad. It's so terrible. Go and do something about it. In 1940, my grandfather opened the yeshiva. How does my grandfather, he's 36 years old. How does he open the yeshiva? So when he was in Germany, he was part of the Ezra Zionist youth movement. And this movement, uh, now they reconstituted in, in Israel. And they had a facility and they wanted to open up a yeshiva. And my my grandfather was associated with this movement still in, you know, his time and his duration in, in Germany. They said, okay, maybe he'll be the one to head the yeshiva. I'm sorry, I had misspoken. I said he was 36 years old. He was 34 years old. So they come to him and say, okay, you want to open this yeshiva? And he's like, I'm not going to open up a yeshiva. What do I know about opening yeshivas? So someone told him, well, if you don't open the yeshiva, someone else is going to open the yeshiva. So they went to the Chazanish, and the Chazanish said, open the yeshiva and it'll be successful. And indeed, he did it. And from 1948 until 1983, my grandfather, for 35 years, headed the yeshiva in Ber Yaakov, in the, the small suburb of Tel Aviv. And in that capacity, he was able to build students they became great Torah scholars. Again, this idea of there's opportunities out there. And he was someone who was always grabbing the opportunities. After the Six-Day War, there was a groundswell of repentance throughout the land. People witnessed miracles, this transformation. We were on the doorstep of destruction. And they were able to pull off this stunning military victory. And people felt like they saw the, the hand of God throughout the entire conflict. So what did my grandfather do? He starts visiting the secular kibbutzim. He starts writing essays. He starts giving lectures, reaching out, doing outreach before it was cool. In fact, in one of his books, he writes about how he flew after the Yom Kippur War when the, when the Israeli army was already on the other side of the, of the, of the Suez Canal. He flew in an Israeli transport aircraft. He flew to, to Egypt and he would give lectures to these secular soldiers. And by the way, many, many, many of them heeded his words. He used to say, by the way, that his, his most attentive audiences were the not religious people. When he spoke to religious people, it was sometimes in one ear and out the other. When he spoke to secular people, they just ate it up. They, 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 were just, they couldn't get enough of what he had to say. And indeed, like this is someone that's, it's not, it's not, it, it's not something which would necessarily fall under, you know, his responsibilities as someone who's heading yeshiva. But again, he saw an opportunity and he pursued it. In 1966, my grandfather writes Alei Shur, volume one. And he used to even say, there are some people who are bigger than their books. Meaning the personality, the, the stature of that person, the author is bigger than the book is okay, but it's not as great. And then you have the other side, people whose writings, whose works transcend the person, the author. He used to say that the his writings would transcend him. But they are works of such scope, of such ambition. And I think this also fits in to, to this model of someone saying, I'm going to do it because no one else is. In fact, he writes that in the Aleishu volume 2. He says, I really, it's not, it shouldn't be me that does this, but the world needs this book. This book, he calls it, is a shulchan aruch, is the authoritative code for the Musser philosophy. And really, someone else should have done it because no one else did it. I'm going to do it. Again, hard work, tenacity, dedication, spiritual opportunism. He told my, my brother, in fact, he said, don't become a mashtiach. Become a Rosh Hashiva. It's way, way easier. Because the Rosh Hashiva has to give Talmudic lectures. And, you know, there is a five-year cycle when they go through the entire Talmud or the Talmudic tractates that are studied. And then once you finish that, once you master that, you have to work for five years and that's really it. Whereas when you become a Mashiach, you have to give more of the philosophical lectures. And every week and every month, 
you have to work anew. And again, he was someone who his whole life, his whole life was working really, really hard. You know, we have in manuscript form about 2,500 written lectures, essays, treatises that he had written. What he produced is so voluminous, it's so prolific while maintaining all his other responsibilities. And he didn't stop when he got old. When he was 80, he opened up his, his last yeshiva. When he was 90, he wrote his, he published his last book in, during his lifetime. And since he passed, there have been about 10 books that were published posthumously. Anytime there's an opportunity, he went and he seized it. And he, he was the busiest man maybe in the whole country. I remember I once saw one of his letters that he had written. It was dated to the 13th day of the month of Av. The month of Av is one of the last months of the year. There's Av and the El. And that's it. The new year starts with Tishrei. So it's the 11th month of the year. And he starts off his letter by apologizing. And almost every, every one of the letters start off with the same theme. He's always apologizing. Why? Apologies for the tardy response. He wrote this months and months and months ago. I was too busy to answer it. But in one of them, I remember seeing this. He's like, this is the first day of the year that I have free time to write back to you. His, his life was just so replete with work. He didn't have time for the first 11 months of the year. I think we have this magical combination of commitment, hard work, tenacity, and spiritual opportunism. We too can become great people. I want to end off with one final theory that I heard from Rabbi Chaim Uri Freund, who's actually a member of the Badats, a member of the uh, Rabbinical uh, Council of Jerusalem. He told me, I don't know where he got this from, but he told me that the reason why my grandfather became so big is because of his Shmira Seinayim, because he guarded his eyes. Which to me was a surprise because... I've never, I, I never, you know, I never thought that was a heralding quality of, of his, but that was interesting that he said that. But I did remember recently the following amusing anecdote. During that same time, when I'm with my grandfather in the hospital, a nurse walks into the room, and I remember this as vividly as if it was five minutes ago. My grandfather pulled off his glasses to not see the uh, comely nurse. And it's it sounds weird, I think, to Western uh, audiences of why someone would do that. But actually, in the Israeli yeshiva world, it's quite common. If you're going to be in an environment surrounded by women and you want to make sure you don't look at other women, you don't ogle at other women, then that would be something, that would be a tactic that was used. But I remember it was, it was funny because my grandfather was almost 91 years old and it was uh, – and this is the only time I've seen him do that, by the way. But I remember him pulling off his glasses. Maybe he's pulling off his glasses for a different reason. Who knows? My brother did tell over the following story that every Shabbos afternoon, my grandfather would walk from his neighborhood in Yervat Shaul to the neighborhood of Abayt Vagan where the great Kol Torah Yeshiva is located. Because every Shabbos uh, – when Shabbos ended – Matzah Shabbos, Saturday night, he would give a Musr lecture in that yeshiva. And therefore, like once, you know, the waning hours of Shabbos, he would walk over from his, his house to the yeshiva in, in Kol Torah. And he wouldn't like people when people would walk with him. So my brother says he would follow him. He would walk behind him. And that route happens to go through one of the thoroughfares of Jerusalem. I think it's called Herzl Street. I haven't lived there in a while. Herzl Street. He it goes through Herzl Street all the way to, to Bayt Vagan. And of course, sadly, on Shabbos, you still see a lot of cars traversing those streets. You know, Jerusalem is a very religious city relative to other cities in Israel. It's still not 100% religious and there's still cars driving on Shabbos. I will add, by the way, that I myself was once uh, in a car driving on Shabbos. My son Yehoshua was born on Shabbos in 2009. So we took uh, an ambulance flying 90 miles. I've never been so fast in a car traveling so fast in Jerusalem, but because it was Shabbos, the streets were empty and 
the ambulance was driving about 90 miles an hour, which um, was helpful, shall we say. But anyhow, my brother is walking behind him and he says that his eyes were always fixed on the floor and he never witnessed a single car driving on Shabbos. And the idea is, is that, you know, to, to see cars driving on Shabbos in Jerusalem, the holy city of Jerusalem, is something that's very painful. It's very painful to, to say, you know, that we're, we're in the land of Israel, but we're not quite there where we need to be to achieve, you know, the ultimate destiny. So my brother said the story that he was someone who was just careful with what he saw. And then Rabbi Freund said that he was someone that was careful with what he saw. Maybe there is a theme to this. But regardless, I think the the underlying lesson, the underlying takeaway is what my cousin said at the beginning. All of us come from different backgrounds. All of us have different exposures to, you know, to, to growth, to Torah, to, to, to traditional Jewish values. None of us come from the same place. But my grandfather perhaps is going to be the, the paragon of starting off with quite little – and ending up with a lot. And his story and his life story is an inspiration to us. And it's maybe also some which is terrifying to us because it's, it's going to obligate us. But there's an inspirational message that someone who grew up in a home, in an environment, in a community that was very reform, shall we say. We put it bluntly. With a father that was really opposed to making Torah a central part of your life. You know, he used to tell his father, I'm going to become a rabbi. They used to clash with each other. He told his father, I'm going to make 10,000 Bali Tshuva. This is way before it was cool to try to talk about the, the, the Bali Tshuva movement. He told his father that. His father wanted him to be a professor. Or a scientist. And by the way, he would have been fantastic in either one of those roles. He had all the gifts to become someone special in academia. Become a great professor. But what happened? His heart was drawn to Torah. And he put in the requisite work and the effort and the sweat and the dedication to become someone really big. And I want to add, speaking about his teacher, Rabbi Rucham, in 1976 and 1977, Exactly 40 years after his teacher, Rucham, passed away, my grandfather gave a series of lectures on the, the general teachings of his, of his Rebbe, of his teacher. And the idea behind it is, quoting from the Talmud, the book of Avodah Talmud says that a person does not absorb the lessons of their teacher until they've ruminated over them for 40 years. So my grandfather is saying, for 40 years, he didn't stop delving into the teachings of his Rebbe. Dedication, hard work, commitment, tenacity, spiritual opportunism, cleanliness and money, keeping your eyes clean. It's a sure path to becoming a great person. And my hope is that all of us are inspired by his story and we take the time and the care and the effort and the inspiration to become great people ourselves. I want to tell everyone that it's uh, been a pleasure to meet y'all. I'm happy to take any questions, but my email address is rabbiwalbejima.com and you could always email me with any questions, comments, or feedback of any kind.